All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, let's make it quick because everyone probably wants to go to side events. Um, okay. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lloyd. I'm the founder and CEO of Hyperrhythm. We're a crypto prime broker based out of Japan and Korea. Um, today, we're a session. We're, uh, this session is about cryptocurrency adoption in Japan. Um, as introduced, we have um, Akio, Tanaka, Akio Tanaka from uh, Headline, Ryo Matsubara from Oasis, um, and Tatsuya Hashimoto from ASTAR. Uh, let's start with a, a one-minute intro. Um, um, Akio, do you mind starting? Sure. Um, so I'm a partner from Headline Asia, but we also have a, a token fund called IVC, which some of you might have heard about. Uh, we are probably one of the most active seed stage uh, VC investing tokens uh, with about 200 portfolios. And uh, actually, uh, Oasis, uh, Matsubara-san is one of our portfolio companies here. Um, so today, I'm actually here to actually share with you what's happening in Japan. There's a lot of exciting things we're actually seeing, seeing in Japan, kind of opposite of what's happening in the U.S., and SEC. So hopefully we can share with you some interesting news from, from Tokyo today. All right, thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, konnichiwa. My name is Ryo uh, from Oasis. Uh, the question, who has been in IBS crypto in end of June? Woo! Woo! Oh, Woo! okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we, uh, we are Oasis, uh, the gaming blockchain. Uh, uh, born in Japan, and also we uh, had a, a huge you know, side event and you know, using the Nijojo Castle. They announced a bunch of the you know, games. Uh, then today I want to I want to share the, what's happening in Japan, especially in the gaming space. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm I'm really excited to you know, be here. Yeah. All right. Thank you, um, Tatsuya. Do you mind? Ah, 안녕하세요. 저는 Tatsuya입니다. 만나서 반갑습니다. Yeah, I'm from Astro Network, and uh, I'm work for the uh, as a business development, in, especially in Japan. And uh, Astro Network is a layer on blockchain, and uh, also the gates for the uh, Japan market for the foreign com company or project. And uh, yeah, I used to work for the business development at a crypto exchange in Singapore, but now I'm working the Astro Network. And uh, yeah, well, we work with the traditional big Japanese company like a Toyota, Sony, NTT, this kind of stuff. Yeah, we're helping the, you know, the develop, uh, deploy the some of the application in Japan. Yeah. And uh, we aim to the deploying the uh, application uh, as a web we have in the future. So we, uh, for the, our future feature is like uh, interoperability and uh, developer friendly. And uh, yeah, nice to meet you. And uh, yeah, Manasa Pangasimit, uh, Ciao all right, uh, yeah, I think to summarize, um, one of the largest VCs in Japan, um, headline, the largest uh, gaming L1 in Japan, Oasis, the largest general purpose and L1, um, Astar, in Japan, um, yeah, and, uh, yeah, uh, okay, uh, one of the largest prime brokers uh, in Japan, Korea, thank you. Um, and, yeah, so today I have some questions uh, that I prepared uh, for each of you. So um, let's start with um, Akio. Um, can you, do you mind um, shedding some light on how um, um, Headline has uh, witnessed uh, evolving dynamics of crypto industry in Japan, um, especially um, IVS Kyoto, which was held in June, was a huge success. Um, I, I, I think everyone here um, also attended. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, so let me actually talk a little bit about what's happening in Japan and put it some historical perspective. So historically, Japan's been known for probably world's biggest fuck-ups in crypto. <laughs> so Mount Gox? If, yeah, it, yes. Mount Gox was the first and probably one of the largest crypto disasters in history, and it happened in Japan. And then a few years later, we had another... Uh, crypto exchange hack, which was also historic at the time. So what does this mean? Well, Japan actually, yes, went through the worst um, crypto, consumer-facing uh, crypto disasters, but that actually gave us time to learn and uh, um, make some lessons. So one of the things that happened in Japan was that as conservative as the country may look, it was for one of the first G7 nations to actually create a set of regulations on how to uh, run crypto exchanges. So 
one interesting tidbit is that when FTX entered Japan officially uh, two years ago through uh, acquisition of local exchange Liquid, they had to negotiate with the Japanese government. And uh, one of the things that Japanese government insisted before FTX was legally allowed to own exchange in Japan is that uh, they had to repatriate all of the offshore FTX accounts that belong to Japanese users to FTX Japan. Yes, it was very unpopular at the time, I think, for Japanese FTX users, but that happened. So what happened was uh, some people left FTX. They ended up moving to Binance because they didn't want to be part of FTX Japan. But then some other others were uh, basically brought into FTX Japan. Now, fast forward two years. When FTX blew up, if you're a user of FTX.com or FTX US, well, good luck. You still haven't got your money back. But people in Japan be, uh, were actually safe because FTX Japan had regulations to make sure that the exchange had segregated account, as they should, and uh, it is also not mixed with other pools. So they were actually able to rescue all those consumers. So, you know, it's not really well writ written internationally, but I think it's actually a big triumph for the Japanese regulators. They actually created safe rules that didn't hurt consumers. Now, fast forward to today, there are now a couple of major uh, initiatives that's happening in Japan. So Japanese government, for whatever it's worth, made Web3 the national agenda so it's now government's economic strategy. And so the ruling party, LDP, has now established Web3 task force within the government. And then if you go down to FSA, which regulates uh, Japan's financial industry, they even have a Web3 team within FSA. But they're very different from what's happening in uh, SEC. SEC, I don't think is their agenda is to actively promote <laughs> Web3 in the US financial system. It's probably the opposite. So they're suing left and right and center. But in Japan, the FSA team is actually there to try to figure out how to enable new industry. So they talk to us, investors. They talk to our portfolios. And a couple of new things happened this year. One, which is also first among G7 nations, they legalized stable coins. And uh, it's actually not a stable coin. There's a three different kinds of stable coins that's now legalized in Japan and creating rules. And we think all those activities that's happening in Japan, it's not really sexy because it's boring regulatory stuff, but we believe that's going to actually enable us to actually innovate in the, legal, in the legal arena to create new industry. So that's what we're very excited about in Japan. And I think gaming and enterprise are definitely going to be the beneficiaries of the more progressive crypto policies we are seeing in Japan today. All right, thank you. Um, I think that's very comprehensive and uh Couple things to note. First, uh, FTX Japan was 100% solvent. Um, if you search 100, uh, FTX Japan solvency or insolvent, um, I think, and then I think a lot of people know, uh, know uh, knew, uh, heard about this news already. Um, and two, uh, Web3 has become a national agenda for Japan. So I think uh, that's very um, um, insightful. Um, Ryo, can you share some color on how the Japanese government is treating blockchain or Web3 games? Because that's, I believe, uh, that's the focus of Oasis at the moment. Okay. Uh, everybody thinks that it says that Japan uh, have the high potential because we have uh, the huge IP, but the, we also have a problem of a tax. So uh, the Japanese individual, uh, uh, you know, the re uh, revenue from the crypto trading will be regarded the income, general income. The Japanese uh, general income maximum, uh, you know, uh, tax rate is a fifty-five percent. So people doesn't trade. So the liquidity is, you know, uh, the uh, really uh, severe problem in Japanese, you know, crypto scene. Uh, and the bull market is fine. People just buy and hold. It's fine. Liquidity is enough. But in this kind of bear market, people doesn't trade. So uh, Japan has, you know, enough GDP in the buying power because we have the third largest GDP. Even though uh, we we have a large, you know, buying power. Uh, the liquidity is very low compared to the, the you know, the here, uh, the Korea. Uh, the, so we have the, you know, kimchi premium, right? Yep, so yep. maybe, uh, uh, maybe 
few years ago, we have we had a sushi premium yes. uh, with the FTX. Uh, you know, Sam, Sam, uh, in, uh, Sam you know, right, earned with right. the, using sushi. Maybe we, we now have you know wasabi discount, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> so the yeah with, without with, without liquidity, that might be you know really really you know great pot potential. Uh, because you know most of the gaming company in Japan is challenging to Web three because. Uh, the, actually, the Web2 gaming industry is almost a black ocean. So, uh, think about the Web2 you know, industry. Only three titles which has you know, the launch in this year has recouped initial and uh, initial budget. It's more than uh, it's more than red ocean. So, uh, the old, most of them has to challenge into the Web3. Yeah. Uh, so, it's very positive. Uh, you know. Sign for Web3 World, actually. Yeah, uh, that's my you know, yeah. thought. Um, OK, so I think um, Ryo was trying to um, emphasize the liquidity problem that Japan faces despite the uh, economic uh, scale that Japan has. And at the same time, Web2 games are very um, not really profitable at the moment. Um, so yeah, there are uh, opportunities and challenges at the same time that Japan's Web3 games are facing. Um, another question, uh, sorry, the next question goes to um, Tatsuya. Um, so um, I believe um, Astar has many um, dApps and um, applications. Uh, what are the main focuses that you guys have at the moment? Um, I believe um, as a BD, you're probably working on new collaboration, new partnerships. Probably you can't disclose everything today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some are still under discussion. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just wondering, as an as a uh, enterprise-focused L1, what are your focus in terms of business development? Okay. Thank you. Uh, at, at the beginning, like uh, you know, in the Aster network, we we have a lot of the project like in terms of the gaming and the entertainment stuff. But at the same time, uh, as Lloyd San mentioned before, Aster is a layer on general blockchain. So of course we. Uh, you know, work, work with just normal com traditional company like a conglomerate company, or you know, automobile vehicle, or you know, whatever. And uh, yeah, we'll be helping them to you know deploy the application or you know like blockchain, there's something. Yeah, and uh, now we want to you know more looking forward to the working with uh, you know big company, including a Korean company like a you know LG and Samsung, whatever. And we can help them to deploy the application. Like, of course, in Japan, mo most of the big company like, like uh, don't have the specific idea for the blockchain or Web3. Like, you know, let's say the OSHA is focusing more gaming stuff, and then Japan have a, really a lot of gaming company, and then a lot of use case for that. But uh, in terms of let's see the other side, other you know use case or something, it's really true, and uh, they don't have. It's really hard to them to you know. The imagine what what can they what they can do for related to blockchain or something, so now we try to be you know work with them and then think the you know blue, blueprints of the blockchain with them or something like that. Yeah, this is uh, what uh, us are working and looking for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll get back to a follow up question afterwards. Um, next question is just I, I just improvised this one um, and it goes to um, Akio. Um, so I. I noticed um, the Prime Minister Kishida, he, did, uh, he sent a congratula congratulatory um, video to IVS, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it means huge because, um, honestly speaking, like, we cannot imagine, like Koreans cannot imagine, like President Yoon um, sending a video to KBW to congratulate the opening of Korea Blockchain Week. Hopefully we will be able to next year or, the, or a couple years later. Yeah. Um, but, um, I think uh, Prime Minister sending a supporting message to crypto conferences, it's not just that, third, that, that uh, couple minute video, uh, but I, I, I believe it has more significance of Japan putting more focus as a government towards Web3. So uh, maybe if you can give uh, some background, uh, it'll be more helpful. Yes, so I actually did speak with uh, a lot of the cabinet office and also other policy making teams at Japanese government. And one thing I can tell you is that the uh, Prime Minister is not promoting Web3 so that Japan can have the next crypto bubble. That's definitely not the message. So what is the message? Well, it's kind of a nuance, but I think the government realized that uh, Japan 
unlike Korea, actually, and the, the rest of Asia, really didn't have this startup agenda as a main economic policy until quite recently. So as a country, I think the policymakers feel like we totally lost out in the previous cycle of startup booms and unicorns emerging out of that. And um, the whole uh, 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 Web2 uh, 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 ecosystem. So obviously, it's too late for Japan to gain back the last 10 years. So the government is now focusing, OK, what is that new where Japan could still potentially come in strongly and have leadership? And they felt Web3 is such a topic. So what are they actually looking at? They're definitely not trying to turn Japanese consumers into you know, you know, a nation of crypto speculators and altcoins. That's not the agenda. But there's actually a genuine belief, I think, that uh, there are underlying infrastructure with blockchain that can be actually enabling the new industries. So part of that is finance. A lot of you guys involved in that. So they actually want, are looking for new kind of financial products and services being built on blockchain. And the stable coin is just one part of that. And they also realize entertainment, whether it's IP or gaming, is also potentially uh, uh, enabled by the new blockchain-based solutions. And I, then it goes all the way to the industry, which is why, you know, unlike, I think, you don't really hear about other L1 chains working with Sony, <laughs> likes of Sony, Toyota, and, and, those, and NTT, those large enterprises. But that's not the case in Japan, because they genuinely believe that the, uh, actually blockchain-enabled solutions can actually drive Japan's future technical innovation. So the whole fascination with Web3 in Japan is not about you know, token economics. It's actually more to do with enabling industry, enabling technology for the specific verticals where Japan could potentially excel. All right. Um, yeah, thank you. I think that's very comprehensive. Now I sound like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, next question. Um, uh, uh, in line with the government's focus, I think we can talk about uh, regulations. Um, so, Ryo, um, please, can you uh, give some more background of how Japan is treating Web3 games in terms of regulations? So, um, I think Oasis has a special structure um, and has been trying to onboard many Japanese companies to build their Web3 games on Oasis. Um, I believe... Um, those gaming companies had a lot of concerns around regulations. So um, can, we, can we talk more about this? Okay, so first, uh, it's, it's about tax and liquidity. Uh, then second, there's an accounting problem. The Japanese are gaming, most of the lot of Japanese gaming startup are already listed to you know, at the Tokyo Stock Exchange with you know, really low market cap. And it may sometimes 50 million, or 100 million. 50. 50 million. Five zero. He's talking about not the big game companies you know, but smaller, like a social game companies. Right. It's already listed. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, listed company is a listed company. Or, you know, uh, they need accounting audit. So, lots of, you know, uh, talented entrepreneur are, you know, it's in, it's in an, a j kind of jail of the, in being a public company. They cannot do the, some cha the big challenge. And also, the lots of uh, an audit firm like uh, like a big four, or including I I I, I don't mention the exact name. We all know. We all know who they yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the usual suspects. Uh, but they they, they say uh, we won't audit you uh, if you are uh, issued token directly. I mean the fin uh, fungible token. Yeah. So that's a big problem. They cannot. They need to they make the really really complex structure to make the audit firm yes. Uh, the auditors will refuse to audit. Mm. If they, they don't want to do they, that. No, they will audit, but they will not get clean audit, which mm. will be a right. problem as a listed company. Yeah. Then lots of the gaming co listed uh, gaming company will use really, really complex structure. So it takes a, a lot of time to, is to the issue token and also it, the launch their uh, games. Yep, thank you. Um, and speaking of tax, um, I think Astar, was one of the projects that actually raised this issue uh, to the, the, the Japanese government. So um, in Japan, there's this uh, problem called Watanabe Sota problem. Watanabe Sota is the founder of Astar. Um, and 
because he had to move outside of Japan to pursue the business because of taxation. Now this has circled back to the Japanese politicians and it's uh, described as Watanabe Sota problem, right? Yeah. Um, can we briefly um, give more background about this? And then, um, and I also know that uh, a lot of members from Astar are um, either um, in Singapore mm -hmm. or in Dubai, yeah. in Netherlands. Um, I'm just wondering, how, how is this taxation affecting Astar um, in, in expanding your business? Yeah, what yeah, uh, Lloyd mentioned, and uh, yeah, we our so Watanabe is a move to the Singapore because of a taxation problem, and uh, yeah, it's so sad for us because we really love the you know Japanese culture and the food and the IP this kind of stuff. Yeah, but uh, we we try to you know lobby to the you know government, the politicians, or something like that. But they ask us to you know make a use case in the outside of Japan. So that's why we were going to Singapore and then make some use case a lot in, in the over the world. And then now we export export to the you know Japan with the use case. And then we try to be you know work with the Japanese company and the government, local government. Yeah, local government also really interested in the you know Web3 stuff. Actually we have uh, the community for the enterprise and the local government. It's called Astro Japan Loves. It really have a lot of the big name of the company. Yeah, and that happened some of the use case with the you know small startup and the big company or something like that. Yeah, this kind of stuff really like that. And uh, what's the question again? Uh, what's what one? So the problem. Maybe let me yeah, define yeah, yeah. for yeah. people outside of Japan what that actually is. So uh, basically, in Japan, if you're the uh, crypto founder like Astro's founder Sota, let's just say you just did um, you just launched your token. And suddenly, on paper. Maybe your stake in the whole, you know, uh, Astro's token is worth billions. But of course, as a founder, you're not going to sell. You're just holding on to it. But the current Japanese taxation law is that, let's just say, on paper, if you had a billion dollar gain at the end of the year, you are now liable for the tax for your gain, even if you haven't sold a single token. So that creates a problem. Because as a founder, if you try to pay tax by selling your token, you're going to be basically driving down the price of your token in a significant way, and you wouldn't want to do that. But if you don't, suddenly you might be you know, liable for like $500 million tax in Japan, which is crazy. Now, what's interesting is that SOTA problem is used in the government today not as uh, 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 something to criticize the Web3 industry. They're actually using this. Uh, uh, people from the METI, for example, talk about this a lot lately. That, okay, so SOTA problem is a problem for Japan because we, have, we are losing talented entrepreneurs to overseas jurisdictions like Singapore and Dubai. So the government is talking about SOTA problem so that we can change the tax code and in, so that in the future, founders like SOTA can actually stay in Japan and issue tokens without having this kind of crazy tax liability. And good thing is, they're working on it, and it looks like uh, in the near future, it's going to be resolved. So you can actually do what SOTA did previously outside of Japan, and being able to do that in Japan. Right. So basically, if you issue tokens, you were uh, taxed on your unrealized returns. Um, and that prevented Japanese founders to stay in Japan. But now they're moving outside. Yeah. And oh, what's, sorry, what's sorry, scary uh, is now, now they're coming back because it's, yeah. it, it will be solved. Uh, what's yeah. scary is it's only one way taxation, meaning if you have a gain, you get taxed. But if you have a loss, yeah. you don't get tax credit. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, ca ca cover me. Yeah. Yeah, and now it's already fixed about this kind of problem. And now we still have the remaining the, the other problem, like a to the week is we how to uh, holding the token by issued by the third party. It just happened same with the you know, Watanabe Sota problem. So now including a Sota and maybe other of the Web3 uh, entrepreneur try to you know, fix this kind of problem too. And then uh, if fixing this kind of problem and the uh, Japanese entrepreneur is coming to Japan and you know, even the you know, maybe foreign project too, and then we can you know, collaborate well and then maybe in the future Japan gonna be the hub of the Web3. And uh, yeah, maybe leading the Web3, the standard in Japan. And uh, yeah, we, we really, you know, uh, looking forward to working with you guys and collaborate together and, uh, you, know, you know, step up more further Web3 era and the standard. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
So actually, our session was, uh, had a subtitle, which nobody cares, but um, it was Trends and Predictions. So we talked about trends, uh, but we didn't talk about predictions. So um, this question goes to uh, Ryo. Um, I'm wondering how you're thinking of the Japanese uh, crypto or Web3 market in general to uh, roll out in 2024. So 2023 is already August, it's already, it's already September. Uh, this year is almost done, done. So I'm just thinking, what are your predictions for 2024? Um, do you have any um, exciting um, roadmap or any expectations for the market? Okay. Uh, I have confidence that the next con successful model of the blockchain game will uh, come, up, uh, come up from Japan because Whoa. Almost all well-talented talented game developer is in uh, the Web3 gaming, gaming, game development. Mm. Then also, Japan has the third largest gaming market after China and the US. Then also, J Japan has highest AP ARPU, average rate on payment user. Japanese people pay a lot for games, and it's the number one in the world. So it's a good, uh, ob obviously it's a good, great market, the best market for Web3. And by the way, it's very relevant for Korea because Japanese players also love Korean games. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We have people playing games from you know Netmarble here, mm. and uh, also our friends that come to us is uh, also them. War. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it's actually uh, very uh, what he's talking about also very relevant for our uh, Korean friends. Here. Let me add one more thing about Korea. The Korea has second largest in ARPU in the world. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so, and I, also, I think it also works the other way around. So there are many um, Japanese games, um, I mean, from, from 80s, 90s. And even recently, like, there was um, Uma Musume, ah. yeah, which was a huge hit and a, and a, a topic of debate uh, in Korea. Yeah, so I think it works both ways. Oh, sorry, what was the debate? Um, <laughs> let's talk about it afterwards, yeah. yeah. The yeah. trends. Okay, ne ne next successful game will uh, definitely come from Japan mm -hmm. because you know every Japanese game, mobile gaming company is challenging uh, the new thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's still an experimental phase, but I, I'm, I'm confident that they will have, you know, figure out the successful model. Then when the successful mo mo model is found, uh, the huge IP, IP holder will put their real famous, uh, world famous IP onto the success model. That was the same with the uh, Web2 error. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, so we're nearing the end of our session. Uh, let's have a 30-second wrap-up. Um, feel free to um, um, advertise, uh, promote um, IVS. Feel free to promote OASA. Uh, can you, uh, yeah. Tatsuya, do you mind starting? Yeah, I can, for, I can go first. And uh, yeah, as, as I mentioned before, Astro is the gateway for the Japan market, inclu including a Korean company and a Korean project. And then we really look... Uh, looking forward to working with you guys. And uh, yeah, Arsa is the number one blockchain, public blockchain, L1 blockchain in Japan. And uh, we work with uh, you know, Sony, Toyota, this kind of big enterprise, and uh, we know how to work with them. So I'm really uh, well, well, more than welcome to talk with you guys. And also in the next week, in the 2049, in the Singapore, uh, we have a really, really big announcement related to the you know, really huge impact to the global and the Japan. So please uh, don't miss it, and uh, yeah, and uh, please uh, talk later. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, Ryo, do you do you want to go ahead? Okay, I already announced uh, lots of the game at the you know Akio Sans event. So as we we as we announced the game, lots of games are uh, licensed by Sega, and also the first Ubisoft uh, blockchain game title, or also Summoners World from Come to Us and also some game from DMM, a number one you know, browser game platformer, and also well-talented, you know, already listed by the Web2 gaming you know, publisher. Well, it's, it's about to launch their game from around this winter. Yeah, but you, know, you guys know, the, event, you know uh, the gaming industry winter is very long. Yeah, uh, but you know, uh, keep tuned about that. All right, thank you. Uh, lastly, um, Akio, do you mind wrapping up the entire session? Sure. <laughs> well. well Actually, this is something more personal. Uh, recently, our not token fund, our main fund, got a uh, 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 commitment from uh, Korea's government, KVIC, uh, into a new fund. And uh, thank you. But one of the uh, underlying things we're working on is we want to actually build stronger bridges between Korea's venture scene. Of course, blockchain, but also including you know, things outside of blockchain between Korea and Japan. 
And we are also the organizer of the largest venture and Web3 event in Japan called IVS, which is also a partner of KBW. So next year, we are working more closely with the uh, organizers of KBW to bring two events closer together so, so that it's going to be easier for people in Korea to go to both events back and forth, and same for Japanese users. And uh, so our, my, my last message, let's do something exciting together. And uh, we'd love to see many of you in Kyoto in Japan, where we'll have the next IVS. All right, thank you. Um, so lastly, if you're looking to raise funds, go to Akio. <laughs> if you're a game developer, go to Ryo. Um, if you want to work with Japanese enterprises, uh, meet uh, Tatsuya. If you don't know what to do, come to me. All right. <laughs> well said. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you.